In this presentation, we examine the difficult but important issue of the identity of I in Romans 7. Now, to get at this issue, I want to start by having you hear again the text, Romans 7, 14 to 25. And as I read these words, I want you to ask yourself, is this how I would describe myself? Are these the words that I would use to describe my life as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ? Uh, maybe you want to close your eyes and that might help uh, you think about this, but just listen to the text and ask yourself that particular question. So Romans 7, 14 to 25. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see in my members another law at work in my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched person I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Now, when I hear myself say and read these words, the response, thanks be to God, doesn't come so easy or natural, because I would suspect that we would pause over some of the things that we hear Paul saying. Pause in the sense of, is that how we really see ourselves? Is that how we really understand our present condition as followers of Jesus? Now. The issue of the identity of I in Romans 7 is a perennial one within New Testament studies. And so it is, involved, it is indeed a theological debate. But I want you to also know that it has profound pastoral implications. You should be very interested in the subject on a very personal level. You should wonder, now, what is the ongoing role of sin in my life? Now that I'm a follower of Jesus, how much power does sin still have over me? And not only do you personally have a vested interest in this subject, but also in your future life in ministry. Because people will come to you and they will share with you some of the burdens and struggles and sins that they're wrestling with. And then the question is now, what are you going to say to them? Can you hold out for them the realistic possibility that in Christ's power and by His Spirit that they can overcome their sin? Or, or do you have to be more realistic to them? Maybe you say under your breath, you know, I, I bet you they can't do that. Or maybe even say to them, don't be surprised if you don't overcome this sin because, hey, Paul couldn't do the good that he wanted to do. And so as we engage in this discussion, I hope you understand its profound pastoral implications for us personally and also for the people to whom we are called to minister. Now, before we get any further, a couple of preliminary observations. The first one goes like this. Paul uses the first person personal pronoun lots of times in his letters, but he uses them in an especially concentrated way here. In fact, it occurs 21 times in Romans 7, 7 to 25. That makes up about 12% of all the occurrences in all of his letters, right? So 12% so of all those occurrences are packed here into this passage or pericope. And so there is a decided emphasis on the I or the me in this particular passage. The second observation is this. Paul is answering a different question than we're asking. 
or maybe I could say it this way. The trouble in the world that we're thinking of, we're coming to this text saying, what can it tell me about the ongoing role of sin in my life as a believer, as a follower of Jesus? That question isn't one that Paul's answering. And that doesn't mean that it's a legitimate question for us to ask. It just means that we have to be very careful. Right? Paul has a different agenda in this passage. Most scholars agree that Paul is defending the law. Why? Because he's connected law and sin so closely together that, well, the reader might make the wrong assumption that somehow the law is sin. And so Paul is defending the law in this part, as he says explicitly, you know, that the law is holy, just, and good. And so, rather than be frustrated uh, and, and think that Paul maybe isn't clear in this passage, uh, we have to recognize that, well, he's talking about something different than we are. And again, that doesn't mean that it's inappropriate for us to ask the question. It just means that we have to be perhaps extra careful, that we don't uh, rip things out of context, or again, we don't conclude that Paul isn't as clear or logical as we expect him or want him to be or as I have in the PowerPoint here, the, the danger of exege eisegesis, right, of us reading something into the text is higher than it is in perhaps other situations. And the third observation I want to make is an important one, and that's this. Although there's enough information, I think, in the text for us to make a conclusion, the information isn't so clear or explicit that we can be definitive in that conclusion. Perhaps you may remember I often make a distinction between shouting and whispering. I usually say it this way. There are many subjects that the Bible addresses many times and does so in clear ways, and these are the things we as preachers and as Christians ought to shout. But, and this is the important other half that we need to acknowledge, there are some subjects that the Bible hardly ever talks about. And the few times that it does talk about them, it's not so clear. And these are then the things we have to whisper. So whispering in this context doesn't mean that we're wishy-washy or we're indecisive. It just means that we're doing justice to the evidence which isn't so clear. And so in this series of presentations, I'm whispering. And not literally in a decibel level, but you understand that uh, my conclusions, even though I want to assert them and maybe assert them strongly, are nevertheless uh, tentative. The evidence isn't so clear that I have the justification for saying this is the only right interpretation and anybody else who disagrees obviously is wrong. Well then, as we look at this issue, I think it's important to separate two questions from each other. Of course, once we separate them, it somehow complicates matters by making more combinations of these, of these uh, possibilities as an option. But I think it's very important to separate the, the I question from the whoever the I is, whether that person is a Christian or a non-Christian. Let's first look at the I question. This question is less important for our pastoral interest. And we're going to see that there's a variety of views. Uh, the traditional view is going to be Paul himself. The I is Paul speaking personally. But there are a lot of other options that have been proposed as well. That Paul speaks in a much more representative way about, well, uh, either as uh, he's speaking of himself as either Adam or Moses or he is speaking as a representative Jew or as the nation of Israel or a common Jew or just a common person in general. And so we'll see there's a variety of options about the identity of the I. But try to separate that out from you, in your mind from whoever the I is. Is that I, is that whoever you identify as the I, is that person speaking in as a Christian or as a non-Christian? And that is where the more significant issue lies for our purposes. Whether Paul in chapter 7 is reflecting a Christian experience, a normal or normative Christian way of living, or whether he's reflecting a pre-Christian or non-Christian experience. Well, uh, that's all preliminary. Now let's look then for a brief moment at what can be called the traditional view. Now I call it the traditional view, but I have to explain that. It's a traditional view only within the Reformed faith. There are other faiths that have this view, but within the Reformed faith, and 
here at Calvin Seminary. We're a servant of the Christian Reformed Church, and so I'm assuming that most of you watching this video will think about ministry in the Christian Reformed Church or in some Reformed Church. And so it's important for you to know the tradition right, uh, from which you come or you find yourself ministering in and what position that tradition has on this specific question of the identity of the I in Romans 7. So in that way it's called traditional. Again, uh, not, not that other believers of other faith don't have this view, but within our own circles this has been the common position. And on the I question it's uh, pretty simple. The I equals Paul or I could say it differently, this is the autobiographical I speaking. And Paul is speaking as a Christian, right? He's speaking as somebody after his Damascus Road experience. It's kind of like uh, share time in the worship service and Paul, so to say, steps up to the mic and he's going to share in a personal way his own experience as a follower of Jesus. And we can see that uh, there are a lot of proponents of this view. Augustine, you can't usually go wrong uh, aligning yourself with him. John Calvin, especially for reformed people, right? Uncle John is a good person to cite as an ally. But in the more contemporary period, you can see people like John Murray and Charles Hodge and Cranfield and, and, and Packer and Morris. And also, again, as I indicated earlier, uh, theologians and biblical people from other traditions as well. According to this traditional view, as I've called it, um, Romans 7 supports the well-known expression, I think you've heard it before, simultaneously justified and a sinner. You know it's a popular slogan if you find it on a t-shirt, and here's a person who's proud of the fact that they're not only a sinner, but they're also at the same time justified. And that's the idea here of understanding Romans 7. Paul is speaking on the one hand as a sinner, but as also, on the other hand, a person who is at the same time justified. According to this view, Romans 7 supports a question and answer of 8 of the Heidelberg Catechism. The Catechism asks this question, But are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil? And then comes the answer that some people like, or they think it's supported by Romans 7. The answer is yes. Although I want to point out that the Catechism doesn't stop there. It doesn't say just yes, period. It says no, yes, unless we are born again by the Spirit of God. So the Catechism leaves the door open, it seems to me, that uh, we are able to do good, and we're not inclined toward all evil if we are born again by the Spirit of God. Now, the challenging view, and challenging, I call it that because it's challenging the traditional reform view, has a different understanding of both the I and of whether the I is speaking as a Christian or a non-Christian. Let's take the I question first. The challenging view views Paul as speaking more representatively, right? We call this the rhetorical I. And I hope you understand that this is actually a technical form of speech that was known in the ancient world, and we still do it today. I can think of examples in my sermons where I might begin by using an autobiographical I. I might share some personal details about my life in the sermon, but then without even informing the audience, I slide or I shift into a rhetorical I. So in the application, I might suddenly say to uh, the congregation, so in my marriage troubles, and then maybe for a split second, the congregation thinks, oh, why has marriage troubles? But then I go on to say, so in my battle with cancer and in my struggle with the sin of pride, and then very quickly the audience knows, oh, he's not speaking of I as Jeff Wyma, autobiographical. No, now he's using a rhetorical I. They may not think that term, but they recognize that I'm speaking in a representative way. I'm trying to identify with the audience and what kind of experiences they may be going through. Now there are different variations of this rhetorical I that Paul is speaking as a representative. It's the question representative of what? Some say he's, you know, he's speaking as another Adam, or 
He's speaking of Israel. He's representing the nation of Israel and what it was going through. Or he's speaking from the posture of a common Jew or even a pious Gentile. But what these views have in common, Paul isn't speaking first and foremost personally about himself. He's speaking representatively of a larger body of people. But the more important difference about the challenging view is this, that Paul is speaking then in Romans 7 not as a Christian. He's speaking as a non-Christian. Sometimes the words unregenerate is used in these discussions. But notice that I've deliberately added as viewed through Christian eyes. I'm anticipating you see some objections to the challenging view. And so Paul writes not from the point of view before he became uh, a Christian, before he met Jesus. It's not like Paul stuck a, a microphone in front of a of another non-Christian's uh, uh, mouth and, and got a position from them. No, Paul is describing that position, but he's doing so very much as a Christian. And so that's why I have the heading entitled, A Non-Christian, but Viewed Through Christian Eyes. Now to show you that uh, this challenging view isn't uh, an esoteric one, isn't some wild, crazy idea of mine, but actually has some pedigree, some history, I've got some representatives uh, to share with you before we actually look at the evidence. So for example, uh, I want you to see that this view is actually an old view. Going back to the very earliest days of the church, you can see there the early Greek fathers to the fourth century, how many of them adopted this view. Even Augustine actually had this view before he changed his mind. So in a certain sense, the challenging view could be called the historic view, right? It, it goes back a long ways. It's got an impressive pedigree. But not only in the early church was this view held, but also in reform circles. So Anthony Hookema was a systema systematic professor here at Calvin Theological Seminary. He taught here a number of years ago, and in the little book entitled The Christian Looks at Himself, look at the, hear the conclusion that uh, he reaches. He says, I believe that what we have here in Romans 7, 13 to 25 is not a description of the regenerate man, but of the unregenerate man who is trying to fight sin through the law alone apart from the strength of the Holy Spirit. I grant that this is a picture of the unregenerate man seen through the eyes of a regenerate man since Paul wrote these words after his conversion. This fact helps us understand the vivid and perceptive way in which sin is here described. But it is the struggle of the unregenerate man, or the regenerate man when he tries to go it alone, that is here depicted, not the normal life of the believer. So Hukama's bottom line is that, that Romans 7 doesn't describe the regenerate, that is the Christian person, although it describes instead the unregenerate or the non-Christian non person, but does so viewed through Paul's eyes as a believer. A second Reformed witness, it's a bit dated, but I want you to understand that Herman Ritterboss was a very influential New Testament scholar in his day. He taught at the Free University in Amsterdam, and his books have been translated into a lot of different languages. And in the earlier part of the 20th century, he had quite an influence throughout Europe and also here in North America. Now. His commentary on Romans, unfortunately, hasn't been translated, but it was in a very important Dutch series that had wide readership, and you can find in his treatment of Romans 7 this conclusion. This is, this is a translation. Uh, it goes like this. These considerations of the train of thought of Romans 6 to 8 and of individual concrete words and expressions of Romans 7 will have to suffice to prove that we have no other choice but to say that this chapter gives the portrayal of the man outside of Christ in his hopeless struggle under the law. So I haven't repeated, of course, all of these considerations that he's quoting or referring to, but I was struck by that line, we have no other choice. So Ritterboss says that the evidence of the text demands or drives him to this uh, portrayal of a person outside of Christ. In other words, the unregenerate, the non-Christian person uh, that is being described. Now, it's not just the Reformed faith that has this particular position. There are other traditions, too, 
And so Joseph Fitzmaier was an extremely influential Catholic scholar who just passed away uh, a few years ago, and he has an important commentary on Romans, and two quotes that are important. First he says, Paul speaks rhetorically of the ego, that's the Greek word for I, using a figure of speech to dramatize in an intimate personal way the experience common to all unregenerate human beings faced with law and relying on their own resources to meet its obligations. And then another quote, but in attempting to understand what Paul meant in Romans 7, it is important to keep his perspective in mind which is that of unregenerate humanity faced with the Mosaic law, but as seen by a Christian. And so this important Catholic scholar also views Paul in Romans 7 as describing the unregenerate or the non-Christian person, but as he and also I have said, as viewed through Christian eyes. Yet another voice from a different camp is that of Gordon Fee, who represents a Pentecostal or charismatic perspective. He says, this is his important uh, book on the work of the Holy Spirit in Paul's letters. When he comes to Romans 7, he says, There are three matters which seem overwhelmingly to favor the view that Paul is here describing life before and outside of Christ, but from the perspective of one who is himself now in Christ. So, Fee doesn't give us, of course, here in this quote, the three matters, but in his view, they overwhelmingly. Now, Fee is admittedly prone to hyperbole, but again, he finds it quite compelling. He's driven to the view that Romans 7 does not describe Paul as a Christian, but it describes life before and outside of Christ, but again, one viewed through Christian eyes. Our last voice uh, from the evangelical community this time comes from Doug or Douglas Moo, and he has no less than three commentaries on Romans. So Moo has thought a lot about Romans as a whole, and therefore he's wrestled with this particular passage. And uh, he says this uh, about Romans 7. Our conclusion, already indicated in the exegesis of 7, 7 to 12, is that verses 14 to 25, from chapter 7, describe the situation of an unregenerate person. Specifically, I think that Paul is looking back from his Christian understanding to the situation of himself and other Jews like him living under the law of Moses. Paul speaks as a representative Jew, detailing his past in order to reveal the weakness of the law and the source of that weakness, the human being, namely the ego, the I. Now, Mu here is a little different from the other quotes that we have looked at. He's similar in the sense that he sees Paul describing the unregenerate or the non-Christian person. But he's different on the I question, which, as we said, is important, but less important for our purposes than the pre-Christian or Christian perspective. You can see that he, he, he kind of fudges a little bit between the autobiographical I, because he it says it's Paul speaking, but he's speaking as, quote, a representative Jew. And so Mu has a little bit of the autobiographical overlapping with the rhetorical I. But on the question of whether the I is a Christian or a non-Christian, he agrees or he represents the challenging view that Paul is not describing a normal or normative Christian life. Now before we end this uh, brief discussion, which has all been kind of introductory so far, we need to look at the evidence, um, I want you to know that the common view of the church, of the pew, is just inverted to the common view of scholarship. So the common view in the pew, the kind of position that you would meet by Christians, is that, well, the I is Paul. Uh, that makes sense to me, right? People often don't think deeply about these kind of things, and so they know that, that Romans was written by Paul, and if they see an I in there, they just instinctively say, oh, that's Paul speaking, and they know that he's a Christian, and so they think that he's speaking as a believer. But I want you to hear the other side of the equation, namely that the majority of New Testament scholars have the opposite view. Or to put it differently, the challenging view that I'm presenting in this presentation is, again, not an esoteric or a strange or an obscure view. No, it's actually a pretty widely held one. But having said that, ultimately, what ought to drive us in this discussion or ought to control our conclusions is not what Wyma believes, is not what the vast majority of scholars believe,
nor is it based on our experience. I want to stress that because I meet many people from the other side of the view who say, you know, I was a pastor and I've just experienced people who can't seem to overcome their sin or who struggle with it in an ongoing way. And although I'm sympathetic to that position, although I recognize how powerful our experiences, our own and that with others may be, I also want to reaffirm the Reformation motto, you know, sola scriptura. We, we don't base our positions simply on what our denomination says or what our teacher says or what our experiences reveal to us. No, we look to the scriptures. And so the central thing that you and I ought to think about is, well, what's in the text? You know, what does the Bible say? What is found in Romans 7 and in the surrounding context that sheds light on this particular discussion? And so we're going to close this first introductory half down, and when we come back, we're going to turn our attention to that biblical evidence.